like with all the Gen AI talks, this is not as sexy, but it does have AI, <laughs> although it's classical and traditional AI, and um, how we use CDS hooks and CDS cards um, to share a predictive algorithm with a third party. Who am I? I am Kim Nolan. I work at Pfizer. And of course, since we're a highly regulated industry, I walk around with disclaimers. These are my opinions, not my employers. And the algorithm that we use for this um, has not been cleared by any regulatory body for clinical use or patient care. Um, I have been at Pfizer in their medical affairs um, for 20 years, I'm a pharmacist by training. And like if I had to rank my capabilities, I would say like informaticist, clinical, then technical. Um, 10 years ago, I would have flipped the clinical and the informatics, um, but mainly my role now is in the health informatics um, space. So some of the things that I wanted to talk about today, um, beyond the CDS hooks and walking through that process is really as the technologist who are going to be helping to build these, you know, do you understand the responsible AI pillars and why those are important? And then go into the overall all architecture and process involved in sharing an algorithm with a third party and then walk through that CDS hook specification. Um, we'll illustrate um, how the decision support service displayed in the electronic health record and then have a summary and question and answers. Um, for this particular project, we did have a machine learning algorithm. We used the Docker container system and CDS hooks. Um, for this algorithm, just to touch on the responsible AI pillars, um, they had done both internal and external validity. They had used Optum to train and validate, and then they also um, used IQVIA. I think I got that switched. It was the other way around um, to do it. But then when we sent the algorithm out for independent review, they were like, your ground truth is not good enough. And so that's why, like at this point, our algorithm is not usable for um, external use. But with any algorithms, these responsible AI pillars are very important. Like with transparency, you can fully read the methodologies that they use to develop the algorithm, that it's explainable and interpretable. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know every component of how they get to from the input to the output. But if it says I'm predicting hypertension, you understand that they have a cardiomyopathy or they have some, you know, you understand those um, variables. Fairness and bias. And then probably one of the most important is, you know, the evaluation of the clinical utility. How does it improve that health outcome and did you test it in the workflow? Um, this is uh, the conceptual diagram, um, architectural design of delivering our AI model to the third party. If you look, there's three domains. Um, there's the Pfizer in infrastructure where we containerize the algorithm. Then we ship the algorithm to the third party. And if you look in the middle pink where you see HSP, that was our CDS service. And then the care orchestrator was the CDS client. So all of the algorithm information was hosted on the third party so that we didn't um, get any patient data. Because that's super important when you're like trying to share something with somebody else and not having to get into um, patient privacy issues with the, with the developer of the algorithm. From our perspective, we wanted it, the design to be manageable and scalable. We also know that um, for different users of an algorithm, they're gonna have different levels of IT maturity. Um, for the patient privacy reasons, we wanted it to be hosted on um, the host platform. You wanna be able to protect your IP and you want to be able to manage a large number of applications. And then you also need a way to track um, any drift that happens with the model long term. And then the end user is how you would activate the system. So I'm going to go into that middle section now. 
um, with the CDS client and the um, CDS service. So if you look at how we executed um, the container application for the CDS hooks interface, um, over there in the big blue box, um, that's the CDS service. So all of the information in there had to be done by the developer of the algorithm. So Pfizer had to create all of that information to ship over to the third party. And then the third party um, is had the CDS client to be able to do that. So I'm gonna walk through each of these steps, but that's just an overall um, diagram of how it worked with steps one through 10. So when you look at the CDS hook and prefetch, um, this was, so one of the roles that I had as the informaticist was, um, I, even though I'm clinical, I still needed to work with my therapeutic area expertise, expert, and um, to make sure that I was looking at everything right and doing everything. So I was kind of a translator between our therapeutic area expertise and our engineers and the developers um, of this container and the CDS service. Um, so we created um, a data chart that showed all the variables, the data sources, the fire resources, and then the operational definitions. The engineer took that, he wrote the code, um, and then upon opening an encounter for the patient, that would trigger the CDS prefetch, the CDS hook and prefetch the data. Um, steps two, three, and four was where the REST call would invoke the process of the CDS service, and we looked for things like formatting and quality check, um, we actually did this in a different country than the U.S., so we had to ensure that the ICD-10 codes would map appropriately because the codes can vary slightly. And then if there needed to be any data validation, that would happen in step four. If any of these components failed, it would send a status code um, out. Step five was um, the error message returned. Um, if checks or val validations failed, and this was just a library of our error codes. Um, the next step, so for the actual model, which in that other diagram, the model was over here on the far right. Um, before that, we had the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we were able to repurpose the chart that we had used for the prefetch um, and use this for the inclusion and exclusion criteria and with direction, um, and then you also have to modify things um, depending, like for this particular one, this, the algorithm used people who already had the disease state. So like now we're trying to find somebody who had the disease state. So you'd wanna exclude the people who had the disease state because they already have it. So there's little things that you have to work through from a clinical standpoint. So the engineer took this, wrote the code, and created that next step with the inclusion criteria. We created six um, CDS cards um, for this particular one. Again, we had to work with our therapeutic area. I helped translate that into the specs um, for the CDS cards. We worked with um, a user um, interface person for um, beautification and then the card put out. All of them, except for the inclusion exclusion, card two happened um, once it entered the model and would tell you whether the patient was at a high suspicion, low, low suspicion, or there was no prediction for some reason. This is just a display of this particular um, interface. It was with cardiologists of what they would look, what it would look like. And this is synthetic data, so that's not a real patient um, uh, for the user. And then you can see here how the card rendered on the far, your far right. So in summary, this pilot demonstrates an innovative architectural solution for del delivering machine learning models to healthcare professionals. It kind of, it showed our pattern, communication patterns based on CDS hooks, um, CDS cards and rest calls. Um, we preserve patient data privacy because it was hosted on the third party. And um, we also, uh, 
thought, think that this pilot could help inform how to share other ML models to HCPs. Um, definitely execution requires cross-functional expertise. Um, at the time, uh, Pfizer does something called secondments where you can move into a role for a year um, while your other job is maintained so you can get cross-functional expertise. So I actually was part of the architecture team um, when we did this versus the medical team. Um, and so we had the clinical informatics, the medical architect, engineering and development. And then with all of this, again, just as a reminder to remember those responsible AI pillars. I wanted to thank George and Reed because they were very helpful. George was the main architect and Reed was our engineer that was on the project. And um, we all three worked together through the project and with this presentation. This is my contact and then I will open it up for questions. Was that uh, Cerner that you were implementing it in, or was that something else? Did, did you do more than one EMR? Well, it wasn't actually an EHR. It was a diagnostic tool, uh, a di cardiology diagnostic tool um, that may be located in the Netherlands. <laughs> Say no more. Well, you know what, in the article, we wrote a paper together, it's in there, but I was told I couldn't say their name in public by my lawyer um, unless I got approval for that. <laughs> but it's a cardiology diagnostic tool, and so they have a whole suite of cardiology tools that have um, displays for uh, interventional cardiologists. So in the integration, you haven't mentioned anything about the security. Is that primarily because the underlying assumption is it's going to run in the client environment? Yeah, um, so our project was just a technical feasibility. And so we were just te testing, will this work? If we put it in a container, we use the CDS hook, CDS cards, will this technically work? And we proved that. But yes, security would be another layer in there that would you would need to do also um, for it, but it is in the host environment, so just guessing that would be more on the host than from. But even if it is in the host environment, I think your algorithm deployed through the Docker container is making an intrinsic assumption that the client environment would be secure. In other words, like between the client's other application and your algorithm, the communication between those two, I mean, either you guys need to um, make it secure or go with standard protocol so that you, basically what I'm coming at is you cannot make an intrinsic assumption that the client said it will be secure, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you're correct. There would have to be more done with security. That just was not a piece of our project because it was just technical feasibility that it would work. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? And thank you very much. Thank Kimberly. you. Thank you.